on? I think it's on. <clears throat> well, good evening. It's good to be uh, back in South Carolina because I've already gone back to Tennessee <laughs> and, uh, and come back. This weekend, I was uh, able to go to a friend's wedding that was uh, near Jackson, Tennessee. So that was a fun drive to make, but very relieved to be back here. Um, where I'll be for a few more weeks, and then I'll go back, and then I'll come back here. So, um, but it's good to be here with you tonight. Um, it's officially been the weirdest day of my life because, okay, maybe not the weirdest. That's an exaggeration. But um, when you get five hours of sleep and then need to drive, it'll do some weird things to you. And I had a Taco Bell burrito at 10 a.m. this morning. So I hope you won't hold that against me, but maybe that will give me the energy still to, uh, <laughs> to stay awake the rest of tonight. Um, so last week we started a new study um, on Ephesians, which goes really hand in hand with the Sunday morning series that we've been doing that Keaton's been uh, bringing to us. Uh, about First Timothy, who was the preacher in Ephesus. And so this is really uh, good to be able to study, and it, it, again, goes hand in hand. Tonight, in our second um, lesson in this series, we're going to look at Ephesians 2. We're going to learn how to be rooted, what to be rooted in, why to be rooted, all the, all the question words. Um, you may have heard... A man by the name of Frederick Nietzsche said, God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. He said that in the 19th century, um, at the very end of the 19th century. And he was trying to imagine a world without God. Tragically, he tried to imagine a world without God. That was in the 19th century. Um, what about something a little bit closer to home? I don't know how many People drive the same way that we do from Rock Hill to the church building. Um, the interstate, I think 77 is what it's called. Um, you've seen the billboard out there that says, life is short, get a divorce. Is that infamous around here? Has that been there for a while? Um, yeah, that's rough to look at. That makes you sad every time you know, you're driving to church. Life is short, get a divorce. On the, uh, on the way... I guess southbound, they added a new one with um, fancy graphics of the wedding rings being broken. They did it twice on both sides, or once on both, on both sides. Uh, today in the world that we live in, alcoholism is glorified. Um, homosexuality is commercialized. Forgiveness is scarce between people. And these are things that are a result of a world where people imagine there is no God. Something that was said back in the 19th century has really framed a lot of what the world views and, and formulates their worldview on. And they formulate their beliefs and their ethics on this basis. In Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1... Um, Paul, in a sense, speaks to this. He says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince and the power of the air. The different ones. Yeah. Great. I already broke a microphone. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in, once, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, <clears throat> among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. If you skip down to verse 11, he says, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands remember that you were at one time separated from Christ 
alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. It's interesting because Paul here brings up um, an interesting point about our relationship with God and our relationship with our fellow men. Um, In the first couple of verses, he speaks how we were lost in um, our relationship with God. We were trespassing against God's covenant. And then later in 11 and 12, he talks about how we have um, been alienated from each other as people without God. So it presents itself um, both ways. Of course, the Bible speaks to this um, very commonly. Um, it's mentioned here in Ephesians. The Old Testament is, uh, I heard someone say recently, Genesis is one of uh, the best books ever written that describes and depicts the human condition. Um, And you could say that about Genesis, but there's also so many stories in the books of uh, Judges that depict some really terrible things that humans did. Um, And it's, it's indicative of the way that our minds want to work. We get pushed towards evil. And um, you remember the verse in Judges chapter 21, the very last verse of the book. What does it say? Um, That there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The verse is trying to teach us and tell us and warn us that when we're left to our own devices, we tend to act violent and predatory, and greedy, and selfish. And that's what happens when we live without God. That was also the case back even further in the time of the flood. Uh, Right before God goes to Noah, and Noah is introduced, it tells us that everyone's thoughts were on violence continually, on evil continually, uh, not violence. The whole world was um, encircled and shrouded in this evil that they were living in and that they perpetuated and and made worse and worse. You know, today we may not say, people, secular world and and even us subconsciously, we may not say God is dead, but we may say something like, do what makes you happy. Or we may say something like, follow your heart. Um, I know we pick on those phrases a lot, but it's very true. When we say things like that, we're running counter culturally to or counter counter to God's uh, commands. C.S. Lewis said this. He said, "In a sort of ghastly simplicity, we remove the organ and demand the function." What he means by that is he was saying that basically we take someone's heart out of them, but we ask them to be loving, and that's what we do when we remove God out of our minds out of the world, and then expect to be moral people and to choose the good. We ignore God, and then we expect the very things that come from him. That's the worldly attitude. And we've done this on a personal level. This is what Ephesians 2 is talking about. He's speaking to Christians here. We were dead in the trespasses and sins in which we once walked, following the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, and um, verse 12, we were without hope and without God in this world. So we have done it before we became Christians personally, and then the world continues to do it on a larger scale. What I find really cool, though, is last week we studied Ephesians chapter 1, and there's a couple of Um, places in Ephesians chapter 1 that help us out in Ephesians chapter 2 since it's cohesive. If you look in verse 4, he says that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Verse 5, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Verse 5 also says, according to the purpose of of his will. Verse 9, he also says, according to his purpose. Verse 11 says, we have been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things 
according to his will. In verse 10, he also says that it was as a plan for the fullness of time. So to me, what's interesting is in Ephesians 1, it kind of gives us a hint at maybe what's going to come in chapter 2. He talks about a ch- that we were chosen. We were predestined. We have a purpose. He has a plan. And that's really cool to me um, for a lot of reasons. But if God chose us and he predestined us and he gave us a purpose according to his plan, what is that purpose and what is that plan? And, you know, we could get really philosophical and people do and they spend hours talking and arguing about what our purpose is as humans. That's a big question. That's important to us. And I think, you know, we may phrase it a little differently in the church when we ask this. We say, what is God's will? What is God's will for my life or what is God's will for me to do in this situation? Um, It's a fair question to ask. But Paul hints on it here. He says that we have a, we were chosen, predestined. There's a purpose and there's a plan. I don't know if um, anybody in here has ever seen the Marvel movies. Uh, I kind of like superheroes a little bit. It's a little hard to follow sometimes. But um, in the Marvel movies, Loki is the brother of Thor, the really cool superhero with the hammer. And uh, Loki is a pesky, annoying character because he's always getting in the way of like what's supposed to be going, like what Thor and the Avengers are supposed to be saving in the world. And Loki's always getting in the way. And he got his own show, so they did his own little thing. But in that show, basically, it talks about how Loki always thought that his purpose in his life was to reclaim the throne of Asgard, to rule over his father's um, kingdom. He always thought that was his goal. So everything he did in his life, all of those pesky things, he was trying to get back from Thor, and he was always trying to get that kingdom, right? And then in the show, he realizes at one point that his goal in life is not, his purpose was never to be about gaining that kingdom. His goal and his purpose was about building relationships with those around him, So he changed it, and um, he realized what he called his glorious purpose. That's what he called it. So what's our purpose? If we're Christians and we don't walk in the course of the power of the air of this world and under the, the evil that exists that we used to walk in, what do we do? What's the positive side of this? Am I going to get me a water? Sorry. Um... What do we do positively? So in verse 10, he gives us kind of a hint. First of all, what's important to notice is a couple of words that you might, as I do, have circled or underlined in your Bible. In verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 4, those two words, but God. And then in verse... Um, Oh, where did I lose it? Verse 13, in Christ Jesus, which shows up a lot, but in that particular case, he's flipping the, uh, the script. We realize that these are two times where he talks about how we used to live, but God comes in and changes that to what our purpose truly is. In verse 10, it says, we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So that's a pretty good statement, right? That's Paul's kind of explaining what we're created for. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works. But even though it seems like a really good purpose, that's got to be only part of the picture, right? Because doing good works is obviously a good thing, but that's not the end goal, is it? I don't think any of us would agree that we're literally just here to do good things and then die. That's not the whole picture. We're missing something. He says in verse 21 and 22, the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple 
in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Sorry, I think the burrito is getting to me. So in verse 10, we've got, we're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared so we could walk in them. And then verse 22, we're being built together into a holy temple for God by the Spirit. And that seems a little bit more like a fuller picture of what we're here for, right? As humans, again, doing good works and dying doesn't accomplish anything. That's not the full picture. Imagine that you've built a car or you, um, you mess with some machine. You build a computer, something like that. And something goes wrong. You use the car for a while and something breaks. And you go to fix that thing, but you know, let's say it's um, just for simplicity's sake, it's the, the window roll down button. It breaks. It just doesn't work. So you want to fix it because you have to go through the drive-thru. And in trying to fix that, fixing the window rolling down or rolling back up doesn't do anything on its own, right? Same thing if it were a tire. A flat, fixing a flat tire by itself doesn't do anything for you as a person. You have to be able to do what the automobile is built for to be able to actually fulfill its purpose, which is to drive down the road and take you from one place to another. So these two verses together, Paul's picture that he paints here of created in Christ Jesus for good works. But those good works are to build us up together into a temple of the Lord. <clears throat> good works are the function of a Christian. That's what we do. That's who we are. That's who Jesus was. But the function that we do doesn't make any sense without the desired outcome. What are we aiming towards? We're aiming, like verse 22 says, to be built together into a dwelling place for God by his spirit. If you think back to the whole of the Old Testament, um, this has always been God's purpose for mankind. As early as the Garden of Eden, God walked with Adam and Eve. And then the Ark of the Covenant was built for a place for God to come down and rest on the mercy seat to judge and to be among his people. The tabernacle was a moving dwelling place with the, uh, the Israelites as they wandered for God to dwell with his people in the midst of them. The temple was the same kind of thing. It was just a more permanent structure, a more permanent building in the city of Jerusalem to be a dwelling place for God. And then in Ezekiel 47, there's a really cool vision that Ezekiel gets of God filling the temple with his glory and what that's truly, honestly, supposed to look like. It's beautiful and it's life-giving when God is among his people. For us, the church, we have the same purpose, to be that dwelling place for God. If you look in 1 Corinthians Chapter 6, or I'm sorry, verse, chapter 3. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 3, and then we'll look at chapter 6. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 says, <clears throat> Do you not know? that you are God's temple, and that God dwells in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. God's temple is holy, for you are that temple. And there he's talking about the church, right? That we as a church are a place for God to dwell. And then later he goes a little bit more personally in chapter 6, verse 19. He says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You were bought with a price. You have a purpose. Your body is not your own. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit 
within you. And now that we know our end goal, now that we know what our purpose is to be God's dwelling place among us, what does that mean for us? It doesn't mean anything unless it changes something about us. Otherwise, we look like the world. The, the world doesn't believe maybe that God even exists, but even if they do believe God exists, they may not see that God is trying to dwell among his people. So what does it mean for us? Being rooted in our God-given purpose of being a dwelling place for him allows us to live meaningful lives that choose to please God. And every action that we take every day, positive, negative, um, by actively doing something or choosing not to do something, we're moving away from or we're gaining ourselves closer to that goal. Think about it. Every time that you make an action, you do something, it brings you closer to that goal or further from it. I might need to go to the doctor about this. I don't know what's wrong with my throat. <laughs> Every action we take brings us closer to God or further away from him. It helps us to understand more fully why his commandments matter. God doesn't just give an arbitrary set of commandments that we're supposed to follow blindly that don't mean anything and don't produce a desired outcome. God is intentional. He chose for us to do these things so that he can dwell with us in holiness. We can respect his commandments. In Psalm chapter 1, verse 2, um, David has a really, uh, I think, a really mature view of this. He says, The blessed man delights in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Which is hard for us to think about sometimes. You know, we don't like to think about laws and rules governing us. But when we realize what they're for, and we realize that God has created us for something, we realize why they matter. We realize how we can live that out. Being a walking dwelling place for God is a tough task. You know, when you think about it, the temple was a static structure in Jerusalem. And not, I don't mean this to diminish the temple, of course, but you could sweep it out. Uh, you could arrange the furniture nicely, neatly, and then you could go back to your home and go about your day, and God would remain <clears throat> there in the temple. As a living, walking temple for God, we bear the responsibility of holiness wherever we go. And that's a big deal. It's not something that we can leave at the door. It's not something that we can get away from or hide from. We bear that responsibility of holiness every minute of our lives. So because of that, what we do with our body, as 1 Corinthians 6 said, what we do with our body, what we digest with our mind, um, what we think, what we do, how we help people, what we say, everything we do, again, brings us closer to or further away from that goal. And the reason that we want to be a dwelling place for God, the reason that matters is because he wants a relationship with us. He wants to redeem each one of us. You know, Imagine if he left us in this condition, dead in our trespasses in which we walked, <clears throat> disobedient, living in our passions and desires, having no hope and without God. Imagine if he left us in that state. He didn't. He's a loving God. He cares for us. He wants a relationship with us. He wants to have a relationship with us. <clears throat> he wants to redeem each of us. Living a life without God or pretending that he isn't there 
or ignoring his commandments is denying our purpose for creation, to be with him. He came down, he sent Jesus to die for us, to love us, to show us that we are, that we have a purpose, that we're loved, and he wants a relationship with you. If you're distanced from God tonight, if you've struggled and if you don't have a relationship with him as you desire, as he desires, if you've struggled to understand and obey his commandments, just know that he's still willing to pull you out of that dead state. He's still willing and, and wants to pull you out of that into his light, into his love. He wants to be with you. And if you need help to do that, and if the church can help you at all tonight, to walk through that for prayers or anything that we can help you with, why don't you come forward now as we stand and sing.